everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Rapid Learning for Precision Oncology. I'm Christina Jewell of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars, advancing scientific collaboration and learning. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button on the lower left. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Marty Tenenbaum. Dr. Marty Tenenbaum is a renowned computer scientist, internet entrepreneur, and cancer warrior. He is the founder and chairman of, of Cancer Commons, a nonprofit network of physicians, scientists, and patients that Newsweek dubbed the LinkedIn of cancer. He began his career in artificial intelligence and machine learning, leading elite research groups at SRI International and Schlumberger Limited. Later, as an internet commerce pioneer, he founded or co-founded five successful startups. Dr. Tenenbaum is a fellow and former board member of the Association of the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, a former director of the Public Library of Science, PLOS, and former board member of Patients Like Me. He is also a former consulting professor of computer science at Stanford and currently serves as a director of CommerceNet and Efficient Finance. Dr. Tenenbaum holds BS and MS degrees in electrical engineering from MIT and a PhD from Stanford and has received numerous awards for his work as a patient advocate. I would now like to turn the presentation over to Dr. Marty Tenenbaum. Dr. Tenenbaum? Thank you, Christina, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm going to talk about some of the challenges in precision oncology from a rather unique perspective uh, my background as a computer scientist, internet entrepreneur, and cancer survivor. Uh, these challenges have as much to do with the information and knowledge flows, the informatics of what's going on, as they do about uh, the traditional uh, science and medicine. I'm going to talk about what I'm doing uh, to try to address these challenges in the context of Cancer Commons, a nonprofit organization uh, which brings together physicians, patients, and researchers in the rapid learning community. And we'll first talk about solutions that are aimed directly at helping today's patients try to find solutions for their cancer. That's in part two. In part three, I'll uh, talk about a future vision, and it's not a far future, it's a near future. Maybe in the next six months to a year we'll be there. So that we can talk about not just learning on behalf of, not just doing something to help an individual patient, but trying to drive community learning across the entire community so that we learn from one pa what we learn from one patient can be useful immediately to help uh, the next patient. Uh, I will then uh, address some systemic roadblocks that are necessary in order to be able to realize this vision and uh, also uh, what's going to, what it's going to take uh, to solve those roadblocks and that's going to require collective action on the part of all of us. And, and finally, some takeaways, which uh, hopefully will provide some new perspectives uh, to everybody in terms of uh, whether you're on the informatics side or the medicine side on what we need to do in order to be able to uh, take, uh, realize the promise of provision uh, oncology. Seventeen years ago, I was diagnosed with melanoma metastatic liver, which is a wicked uh, prognosis and uh, uh, wicked disease of dire prognosis and uh, frankly I didn't know what to do. Uh, I went to a few doctors and uh, they told me uh, that uh, things were not good, uh, there wasn't much to try 
I wasn't willing to take that for an answer. So I expanded my search, and in the end, uh, with the help of some friends at the National Cancer Institute, I probably talked to a couple of dozen doctors. And most of them uh, agreed on only one thing, which was that the prognosis was dire. Uh, I was given 9 to 12 months. But everyone uh, said, uh, especially the researchers, that if you had one thing to try, uh, so Hal Mary, why don't you try this or that? And everyone was talking about the thing that you know, they were researching. But there was no data to help me as a patient try to make an informed decision. And uh, that was a nightmare. In the end, I trusted my gut and bet my life on a clinical trial, which ultimately fell. But it helped some patients. I was happened to be fortunate enough to be an exceptional responder, and I'm alive today. And I made a vow at that point that I would, uh, as soon as I got my health back, use my experience as a computer scientist and internet entrepreneur to try to do something about solving the problem of how to help patients make the right decisions. Fast forward uh, you know, 17 years, and things haven't changed all that much. A patient gets diagnosed, they go home. Uh, the first thing they do is consult Dr. Google. And what they get is, uh, if you can read the print here, it says uh, 1.7 million results in 0.29 seconds in one long linear list. And that's not too helpful because uh, the first uh, you know, 100 pages of this stuff is mostly Cancer 101 uh, kind of uh, generalities about what uh, you can do to help yourself. This is the man who saved my life and the paper who, uh, that saved my life, uh, which was literally on about the 5,000th screen of a Google search. And the only way one could have found it is that someone told me that Don Morton had something that might be helpful to me and uh, go look for it. And what's uh, even more frustrating is this paper, which was written uh, 14 years later and published posthumously uh, in uh, 2014, uh, in which uh, my case is included as one of the case studies that was covered. And it said that you know if you have uh, metas uh, melanoma metastatic to liver, and if uh, the uh, cancer can be uh, excised, the metastectomy is an interesting thing to try, along with some kind of immunotherapy uh, to wipe up the remaining cells. This is the situation that exists in medical literature today. But I, 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 guess, I, I guess the point I want to make is that uh, uh, although this paper was there 14 years later, retrospective, it's still very difficult to find because Don didn't publish in in Nature or Cell or Science, he published in the Annals of Surgery. And that's not highly indexed. Google is not a good way to find needles in a haystack. What we're looking at here is a scene of the plenary session of the ASCO meeting. If any of you have been there, uh, you'll realize that what you're looking at is a very small uh, fraction of the um, room. There's 10,000 people in this room. And if you, you know, can pan the camera back out, uh, this, uh, these rows of people will go on as far as the eye can see. Uh, and what's interesting is that anything that's discussed on the stage at an ASCO meeting, for the most part, is going to be three to five years out of date compared to what the people on the stage would tell you privately in terms of what they're you know, thinking at the cutting edge. And it kind of has to be this way because what ASCO selects are things for which there's a substantial body of evidence that's been accrued over a number of years that says uh, that uh, this is you know, valid insights. But uh, if I'm a patient who's dying, I would like to know what's happening uh, at the moment, at the cutting edge, most cutting edge places, what's in the heads of the, of the experts. Now, uh, that's the first mile problem. Uh, the last mile problem is once this thing has been, uh, once the experts have said their, their uh, information, even if it is three or five years out of date, it's going to take another decade or more for this information to diffuse out to the front lines of care where a patient's being treated, say, in West Virginia, unless the doc was in the room at the time this happened or unless he was fortunate enough to uh, see it in a, in a news release or something like that. Because the very next uh, you know, week, another thousand or so cancer papers are going to get published. So we have both the first mile problem of how to get information out of the heads of the experts and the last mile problem of getting that information to the place where it's needed at the time it's needed so that it's not buried under a tsunami of uh, things that are less relevant to, to the patient. This 
has real consequences. And the consequences are measured uh, most immediately in terms of the variations in treatments and outcomes across patients in different institutions and different geographies. Uh, to the left, uh, what, what uh, you're seeing is a comparison of five-year survival for uh, early lung cancer patients at a community hospital and a nearby comprehensive cancer center. And this slide's a few years old, and perhaps the variation has reduced somewhat. But the point is that this stuff, uh, that variation in care, varies widely and falls off very quickly as one moves from the centers of knowledge out into the community and then especially into the disadvantaged communities, the rural communities, and the third world communities. And it's kind of outrageous to think that this can happen in the uh, internet age. But nonetheless, there's a substantial number of lives that are at stake. On the right, uh, you see a similar comparison across seven uh, Western European countries. This was from, uh, I believe, a 2015 uh, very uh, detailed survey of uh, outcomes. And uh, you might notice that this is a five-year survival for all cancers across these countries. Uh, in Sweden, the number was 65%. In the UK, it was only 50%. And these countries more or less had access to the same uh, knowledge and, uh, and drugs in principle. Nonetheless, there's a 30% difference. And given how many cancer patients are involved across all of these countries, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of lives. So what can we do about that? Well, the, uh, what we can do is challenging, because in the last 17 years, things have gotten more difficult, not easier. There's certainly a lot more choices of, uh, of promising therapies that a patient and their doctor can consider. But we now, uh, thanks to um, the Genome Project and uh, progress in cancer biology, understand that many, many cancers are different from each other. Potentially every cancer, every patient is a snowflake uh, with a tumor that's molecularly different at some level, whether that's uh, you know, critical or not to, to the treatment remains to be seen. We now have hundreds of good therapies, uh, many targeted therapies, and we know that these drugs have to get used in combination. The problem is that when you have combinations of hundreds of drugs taken, you know, four or five at a time, not necessarily in parallel, but uh, over the course of a, of a treatment, over the course of a regimen, uh, there's a lot of, there's tens of thousands of plausible combinations that need to get tested. And given that potentially every cancer is unique, there's uh, kind of no way that you can test uh, to find optimal combinations of therapies within the context of randomized trials as they're now performed, given that these trials take hundreds to thousands of patients each and take five to ten years. There's uh, just no way to systematically explore that space. Uh, and as a result, I'm going to make a fairly bold statement that there's no one who can confidently say they know the optimal way to treat any cancer. And as an example, uh, I will point at the fact that in the last five years or so, there have been uh, something like 11 new melanoma indications that have been approved by the FDA in the United States. And uh, we know that these uh, uh, therapies uh, need to be uh, used in combination. And if you think about it, uh, okay, so uh, um, 11 things, maybe there's uh, four more or five more older therapies that are uh, your treatments, including surgery and radiation and uh, various kinds of chemotherapies that are used on melanoma patients. So maybe 15 things have taken a half a dozen at a time, if you remember from your high school combinatorial mathematics, tens of thousands of things. To say nothing about what order these things should be given in and when you should start and stop them, which means when they should be overlapped and what the dosing should be and all of those things being uh, unique to each individual. So I will go one step further and say not only does no one know the optimal way to treat any melanoma or any cancer for that matter, but no one even knows the optimal way to find out. And that's because people are completely reliant on uh, these randomized trials where the drugs are seldom tested head to head or in all of the rational combinations that are, are, can be done. And I give you a, you know, a pictorial way of thinking about the combinatorics here. 
On the left is the way cancer used to be, uh, say, 30, 40 years ago at the beginning of the war of cancer. Cancer was a relatively simple, I'll call it a 10 by 10 disease, where along the bottom are the standard uh, organ-based phenotypes, lung, breast, colon, and so forth. And there were, you know, order of, a, of 10 or so uh, standardized chemotherapies that were often used over and over again with minor modification in each of these. So we have, you know, 10 by 10 cells, 100 cells. It's about a million patients a year in the U.S. who might be, in principle, able to benefit from clinical trials. So uh, that's about, uh, there's 100 boxes, a million patients. So you've got, uh, you know, 10,000 patients per box. Uh, which is uh, plenty to be able to run trials. But now, uh, in 2017, uh, we have, you know, millions of molecular features, so potentially every cancer being unique, and ten thousands or tens of thousands of rational combinations of drugs. So the number of uh, patients per experimental cell here is epsilon, or zero. So uh, not only is uh, it very difficult to think about uh, finding out optimal regimens with clinical trials as we've known them. But for anyone who says cancer is a big data problem, the dimensionality of the space is so high compared to the number of patients that I think it would be more correct to say it's a fat data problem. And by that I mean there are many, many columns of data that you can get for a given patient, uh, given their, all their omic data and so forth but very few rows in the table. There's not that many patients who are available to test in any of these boxes. So what can we do in the absence of uh, definitive data, definitive studies? And this is one of my favorite quotes from Larry Martin, uh, who's one of my board members of uh, Cancer Commons. Larry says that, you know, in the absence of definitive clinical studies, uh, the best thing that you can do is to uh, tap the insights and intuitions and experience of our best clinicians. And uh, in the AI field, there was uh, one of the founders of the field, Herb Simon, and Nobel laureate, used to say something similar. He said, you know, follow the experts because they know what's going on. So even in the absence of data, it's still the case that there are superb physicians who are out there at the bleeding edge uh, with desperate patients trying all kinds of things every day off-label. And what you're, you see here is a picture of Siddhartha Mukherjee who wrote this wonderful Emperor of All Maladies uh, book. And he's with one of his patients, uh, and he wrote more recently an article called uh, The Improvisational Oncologist, which was a Sunday New York Times article about a year ago. So this lady is very lucky to have uh, a master like uh, Dr. Mukherjee. But what is being discussed here is going to basically stay in that room. She may have a solution that may help her. And if uh, it happened to work, uh, Dr. Mukherjee will no doubt try to uh, come up with a case series of a number of patients or perhaps run a clinical trial. And if this can be replicated uh, widely enough, he'll publish. Otherwise, uh, the, the learning will get lost to the world. Uh, a similar situation occurs with molecular tumor boards, where uh, the most challenging cases are discussed by the best doctors uh, at the best institutions. And this is an ideal situation where one can find out three years ahead of what one would report at ASCO what's going on because these docs are actively discussing the cases. But no one, for by and large, is capturing that knowledge in a form that can do other people as much good as possible. And by that I mean not just what recommendations come out, which probably will go into the clinical record of the patient at least, but uh, the rationale for that decision and equally important, what hypotheses were considered and rejected, and what were the reasons for rejecting those? Because sometimes we may have to go back and reconsider those uh, plan Bs if the patient didn't respond as expected. And uh, yeah. so all of these, uh, you know, every day there's thousands of experiments that go on in oncology offices, and basically nothing gets captured. And I can tell you that if I was ever in a position uh, where I you know, had another recurrence and needed to deal with this, I would want my doctor to know what everybody in this room knows, not just what a particular person knows or understands. And so that's the challenge that I took on in starting Cancer Commons, which brings me to the second part of the talk. We'll introduce briefly uh, what Cancer Commons is, what it does, and how we're using it initially to help individual patients uh, beat their disease and uh, use what we learned from helping one patient to help many others. 
So Cancer Commons is uh, what can be called a rapid learning uh, community uh, for cancer. Uh, what we do is try to help each individual patient obtain the best possible outcome for that patient. And this can include an arbitrary amount of research done on behalf of that patient by uh, members of our community, both uh, scientists as well as physicians. Uh, uh, start with the model, uh, then treat the patient, analyze the results, and if the patient didn't respond as uh, expected, to go back and try to understand why. Ideally, uh, to you know, take post-treatment biopsy to understand uh, if the uh, therapy actually reached the tumor, if it did, did it uh, bind to the right target, did it have the right effect. And if it didn't uh, work as expected, to go back to the doctors or the scientists and say, what did we not understand, either about the person's cancer or about the mechanisms of action of that drug? Uh, uh, and by the way, uh, you don't have uh, five years to solve this problem. You have three weeks because the patient just failed therapy and they'll be coming back and we need to have a plan B at that point. So again, uh, uh, help the patient get the best outcome, learn as much as possible, and then disseminate what we learn as rapidly as possible, not wait three years so that it can come out in a formal publication. Not that we want to get rid of formal publications by any means. We want to augment them with a real-time communication channel that can be used to drive uh, real-time learning. This vision has attracted uh, some amazing people on our uh, Cancer Commons board and advisory boards, and there's just about a, a third of them shown in this picture. But I'll, I'll point out they include uh, the former editors-in-chief of both uh, the Journal of the AMA and of Science, uh, George Lundberg and uh, Don Kennedy. Uh, they include the directors of um, uh, four or five cancer centers and some amazing uh, physicians and patient advocates and computational biologists. Uh, Don Kennedy uh, uh, said uh, what motivated him uh, in, in particular, which is that uh, this idea of putting patients at the front end of this remarkable experiment where we're trying to learn as much as possible from, from each patient. You might paraphrase this by saying that a clinical trial of N patients is really uh, basically N uh, N of 1 uh, studies. And if we can figure out how to uh, you know, exploit the learnings that come out of each of those patients as well as the uh, statistical results that come out of the whole study, uh, then we can make progress perhaps a lot faster and uh, at least help those patients. So uh, going from uh, vision to mission, uh, we see our mission as being uh, a, a multi-channel broker of insights. So the insights can come from many places along the bottom of the slide, and uh, we're capturing them, and then getting those insights out to uh, the front lines where they're needed uh, as rapidly as possible. But then uh, closing the learning loop by finding out from those uh, people who are using them whether those ins insights uh, uh, are, can be validated either in the lab or in the clinic, and uh, closing, closing that loop back on itself so that we can uh, validate and make sure everybody who needs to know uh, whether these insights are, are right uh, does. We're focusing specifically on clinically actionable insights uh, from two unique sources, uh, namely uh, case reports, end uh, uh, of one case reports from individual physicians who are experimenting with off-level drugs, and similar types of N of 1 experiments that are being done in the context of FEMA boards. Uh, we are very much interested in capturing clinical insights from all the other sources as well, but uh, there's uh, lots of people who are in that business, including Google and Watson, and so we're going to focus on trying to get this knowledge, the most cutting-edge knowledge, the most recent knowledge, out of the heads of the experts who are sitting, and getting it specifically to the patients and physicians who need that to act on it, and then closing the loop back. In order to do this, uh, we've, uh, we're building a network of uh, physicians and scientists and patients, which Newsweek dubbed the LinkedIn of Cancer. And with this network, uh, we're inviting patients who are facing challenging cases. Uh, basically, they've exhausted, uh, for the most part, exhausted the standard of care. Uh, to come to us with their cases, we will then uh, send those cases uh, so we're, we're the clearinghouse. Uh, patients do not talk directly to the experts, but we forward the cases 
to the relevant experts and where uh, appropriate and where necessary, uh, convene a panel of experts in, in a sense of virtual human board, discuss the case, and get the answer back to the patient. But more than that, uh, we uh, then take what we learn from this one patient and, and formulate it in a way that can be rapidly uh, found by other patients and the physicians treating them so that uh, what we, we can do and afford to do a, a fair amount of research to help one patient with the view that what we do to help one patient might help 100 others or 1,000 others, uh, depending on uh, you know, how general that, that is. So we uh, have created a uh, platform, uh, which uh, was called Casebook. We're now just calling it the Commons, in which a doctor or a patient can enter the specifics of their case on a, a structured form, uh, which varies a little bit from cancer to cancer. And then uh, from that, you can retrieve uh, cases of similar pa patients who have had similar cases uh, and how they were treated. And if we get from the tumor boards what the rationales for those treatments were, as well as other hypotheses that were considered. If there's only a few cases uh, like yours or like your patients, uh, then you can look through them and uh, you know, generalize that way. But if there's uh, you know, 100 cases that are similar, uh, or potentially relevant, then we need to have a way to visualize those. And for doing that, we've uh, created a product called Cancer Maps, which uh, you can think of as a Waze for cancer, W-A-Z-E, the driving application. Uh, they, just, like, just like Waze does for traffic, where your uh, journey is informed by the experience of motorists who are a few miles down the road from you, the idea with Cancer Maps is to have your cancer journey informed by uh, the experiences of patients who are a few miles down the road, metaphorically speaking, uh, from you in their cancer journey. And uh, what's nice about a visual representation like this is that over time it can be enhanced so that uh, you can overlay it with data, for example, of how many patients went this way versus that way and what the results were. Uh, so we can you know, color code, we can put the thickness of the lines representing how many patients and the color codes in terms of green is better than yellow is better than red. Uh, and uh, cancer maps are, are useful uh, in another way, which is uh, as a way to organize the information that Google, for example, might present as a linear list. So we can take you know, specific high value content, curate it, and associate it with a decision node so that a patient or a physician at a given node trying to make a decision can be able to find, uh, for example, case reports, or clinical trial results, or the blog postings of a patient who are actually on a given trial, uh, or the relevant literature or news articles uh, that are relevant to making that decision. And so we believe this is something that's much more helpful in terms of uh, getting a, a snapshot of what's going on. And then uh, what we do is we ask patients and doctors who use this information to report back what they did and how it worked so that we can continually update these maps in real time. And that's how the learning loop, the primary learning loop happens. When a patient is at the edge of this map, uh, and uh, it's unknown what they should do, uh, that's when they can come and ask Cancer Commons. So Ask Cancer Commons uh, is the name of the service that I was talking about a few slides back when the patient comes to us with a tough case. And by the way, we've, uh, we've now handled about 2,000 cases across all cancers. Uh, which is you know, a, a fair amount, but just a drop in the bucket. So we've got to do a lot better. And one thing that Cancer Maps will let us do is uh, be able to have an answer that we'll, we can give quickly to the majority of patients. And then if they have uh, remaining questions about some gray area of the map, does this apply to me, or I'm at the edge, what do I do, uh, to then allow them at that point to use the Ask Cancer Common Service uh, to fill in gray areas of the map. And when people come to us at this point, uh, we can refer them to a clinical trial or to a particular tumor board with uh, unique expertise in their cancer, or even to a researcher who has been studying those cancers and may have something in the back room that could be uh, very helpful to that patient uh, and which could be ethically tried uh, because the patient is dying anyway. And this is something that, uh, as a clearinghouse, Cancer Commons is very interested in connecting patients with researchers to their mutual uh, advantage. And I'll have an example later in this talk of uh, some actual cases in, in which this has happened. 
So once we get the uh, the recommendation from once we get the recommendation back from uh, these um, people, we will take those insights and put them tentatively oops, put them tentatively on the map. Uh, so you notice these lines are dashed, and the the idea here is uh, that uh, this is provisional, and people will be able to see what these recommendations were from say a top tumor board. Uh, but without having the strength of evidence that it might ordinarily have being uh, you know, coming from the experts and from data. And then uh, what happens is that uh, these can be validated by additional patients uh, who will try them uh, and report back. And over time, they will become you know, more established parts of the map. So that over time, initial trails will harden into highways and then superhighways. And just like ways, uh, this learning process will, will run. So uh, what we're doing with Ask Cancer Commons and MAPS is, uh, like I said, 2,000 patients to date. With the MAPS, maybe we can get up to 10 or 20,000 patients a year uh, using the Ask service to only fill in knowledge at the margins, at the edges of the map. But uh, what we need to do now is to be able to couple in all of the other people who are treating people, patients without, beyond the standard of care, and get them to contribute their cases and their knowledge to this learning network. And that's our goal over the rest of this year, which is to uh, find uh, some uh, molecular tumor boards that are interested in working with us. And we have about a dozen or so who have already indicated. And if any of you run tumor boards and would like to be part of a learning network, uh, we would welcome the opportunity to talk to you. But the goal, in any case, is to take the cases from all of these and put them into that casebook search so that anyone involved in this network can search for you know, cases that are similar to a patient who's having a challenging cancer and be able to uh, confer with their colleagues on those cases and thereby accelerate the learning. Now, I want to say that uh, this is going by itself going to be, uh, I think, tremendously helpful in accelerating the search uh, for, uh, and the validation of promising uh, off-label and combinational treatments. However, uh, it's not by itself enough to efficiently search this, search, this space because this space has a you know, billion cells and there's only um, a million patients. So when AI people come up with these very large search spaces, as you would see in a, program, in a, in a game of Go, for example, which an AI program just beat the world master, that's not done by exhaustively searching the space. It's done by making a good guess of where to search, search in that area, and if it's working out, then search deeper, and if it's not, jumping to a different place. So we need to uh, prospectively uh, layer an air traffic control system, so to speak, across this network so that we're not just capturing the cases, but we're actively coordinating uh, the search of all these different organizations so that if something, for example, is working uh, for a patient in the ASK domain, that, uh, and there's a similar patient who presents elsewhere in the network, that we can pro prospectively uh, and proactively recommend uh, this as a potential treatment uh, so that there's a kind of rapid replication. And similarly, if something's not working, to try to rapidly quash it before everyone keeps going down the same rabbit hole, as often happens for years with therapies that are known by some people not to work, but not yet by everyone, to the great detriment of the patients who get putting into that. So uh, collect, capturing the cases is step one, and then putting an air traffic control system on, on top of it to coordinate it all is uh, where we're headed. And that's going to take us into the next part of the talk, which is uh, the vision. So I'll get back and talk more about that air traffic control system. But first, I, I want to uh, say uh, some, some things about where the field as a whole is headed. This part of the talk uh, has been uh, well documented in a Nature Reviews paper that I wrote with my colleague Jeff Schrager uh, back in 2014. And uh, if any of you would like to follow up, I, I recommend you to it. Uh, the paper talked about two things. It talked about precision oncology 3.0, which is the next generation of precision oncology. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. And it also talked about uh, putting a layer of coordination on top of that uh, the technical term was global cumulative treatment analysis, and I'll talk about that after I introduce precision oncology 3.0. So this is precision oncology 2.0, which is what's happening uh, at tumor boards today and the 
uh, services like foundation medicine and man health might provide. So a uh, patient is getting biopsied, sequenced. Uh, the uh, sequences of the tumor and the normal are being compared. Uh, based on that, you choose a target, look up in the data knowledge base to find out what uh, you know, uh, treatments, uh, usually single targeted therapies can be done. Uh, typically not too much uh, testing uh, before you give it to the patient, although there are some chemosensitivity tests. But when the patient's treated, uh, they're monitored, uh, you know, a couple of months later uh, with either a scan or some biomarkers. And then if there's a recurrence, they're re, re biopsied and the cycle can, can, can return. In Precision Oncology 3.0, Every single stage of this is, is going to uh, be uh, improved. And this is happening uh, in, in different levels at different places today. But no place is, is uh, doing all of these progressions. So let's go through them. First of all, biopsy is being replaced by multiple biopsies uh, and uh, specifically adding liquid biopsies. Because of the realization that cancer is so heterogeneous, and we're seeing, uh, you know, results where uh, there's uh, people are trying to compare uh, the results of uh, uh, molecular assays across different commercial tests. And there's little concordance. And uh, many of us believe that a major source of the disconcordance is just the heterogeneity of the tumors themselves and even within a tumor. So uh, multiple biopsies. Sequencing is uh, uh, giving way uh, slowly to panomics. So uh, not, not just uh, genetic uh, expression, but uh, copy number and RNA expression, RNA-seq uh, data, uh, increasingly proteomics, even metabolomics. All of these things are going to become important as we move forward. And then what used to be simply comparing of uh, two uh, genomes, a uh, normal cell and a cancer cell in the same patient, uh, will be uh, increasingly uh, handled with sophisticated uh, computational and systems biology tools to do network analysis in which uh, we can try to prune all of the mutations and try to decide which ones are actually relevant to the behavior that we're observing and what uh, pathways are being driven so that we can approach uh, cancer at the level of uh, the hallmarks of cancer and try to decide, you know, what combination of drugs needs to be applied to knock out the hallmarks that are driving a particular tumor, whether that be uncontrolled growth or uh, inability to stop growth, uh, to put the brakes on, or uh, cell death, uh, et cetera. Now, uh, the idea of looking up in a, in a, a report from Foundation Medicine what, uh, test, uh, what drugs are indicated by a test is going to be replaced increasingly by uh, very sophisticated treatment planning informed by the network analysis and uh, typically involving either tumor boards or the moral equivalent of them. Uh, and then uh, we're going to see uh, these hypothesized tests being tested outside of the patient, either in, uh, in cell lines from that patient where possible or potentially in a, in a, a PDX uh, mouse model or maybe uh, in, in the not too distant future in in silico models. Um, and let's see, I'm going to go back here. And then uh, uh, the treatment will almost uh, invariably be combinations of therapies, not single therapies. And uh, finally, uh, increasing reliance on uh, serum markers. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to be focused on uh, this particular area which is the uh, increasing importance of informatics, cancer informatics, I'll call it, to distinguish it from bioinformatics, per se, which is specifically focused on trying to take the results of the uh, panomic analysis, try to decide what's going on on a molecular level. What we're talking about here is uh, taking the results of the network analysis and trying to decide what to do about it clinically, which is going to take into account uh, facilitating the, uh, all of the decision-making of these tumor boards, as well as the information that we can get off of uh, whatever uh, external tests can be done before it's administered to the patient. This is not my slide. It comes from uh, Denise Wolf and Hope Rugo of uh, UC San Francisco, uh, who are working on an ambitious plan to create uh, just such an informatic system. 
And uh, I'll, it's a little bit complicated, so I'll take you through it. But I, I do it because it's representative of the kinds of uh, informatics that are being developed by uh, advanced tumor boards around the country in one form or another. So in this particular case, uh, the stage four patient on the left uh, presents. Uh, they get biopsy, and their case is presented to a molecular tumor board, uh, which makes a treatment decision informed by two things. First of all, the results of uh, next generation sequencing, and in their case, microenvironment profiling of the uh, uh, tumor microenvironment, uh, as well as uh, a Bayesian uh, prediction model, which is based on the, previous, and the responses of uh, previous patients. So you have these two things in, in forming the tumor board. And in addition, they uh, even have uh, some of this external test, oh, excuse me, and the, uh, the response uh, prediction engine is, in fact, informed by uh, cancer registry, in their case, uh, UCY or beyond. And uh, the, the model also, their, their, their model also includes integrating the tests of uh, the external tests of xenografts or cell lines uh, to be able to inform the decision. Uh, the final thing is to close the loop. So based on the patient gets treated, uh, the results go into the registry, and, uh, and the registry updates, and that will help inform the treatment of the next patient. Uh, similarly, if the patient doesn't respond, it's uh, back to the drawing board and re-biopsy the tissue. So this is their vision and what they're working on. And uh, another slide that comes from uh, their deck uh, is uh, a list of a half a dozen or so other uh, programs which uh, they're uh, collaborating with uh, that have you know similar things that they're doing, all of which are different. So in that context, let me go back to this slide which I showed you previously where I said we have to do air traffic control over this and overlay on it uh, an icon to indicate the uh, different Bayesian decision engines uh, that people are experimenting with and, and developing. Uh, some of these might even be just humans, uh, the docs at the tumor board integrating in their minds the knowledge of what's going on here. So uh, again, our goal is to be able to integrate all of the uh, uh, treatments and outcomes and rationale uh, and use that to try to coordinate across all these things. So if something is working, it can be rapidly replicated when a similar patient presents elsewhere. And if it's not working, it can be quickly quashed. There are two important, without going into the technical details, which you can find in the Nature Review newspaper, there are two important things that go on at this level which are novel. The first is that if it's not clear what's the best thing to do, uh, if there's an equipoise situation, then the right thing to do is to select a therapy that is going to uh, maximize learning for the system as a whole. So this is the key idea that turns all of this into kind of an extended registry trial. So uh, all things being equal, uh, if, we, if we know if the patient, if, the, if there's a clear best thing to do, or if the doctor or patient has a strong preference, then ethics would uh, compel us to do that. However, in equipoise situations, which are more common than you might think, the system can help create, uh, can help uh, people uh, choose uh, things that are going to maximize learning so that everyone doesn't keep trying the same thing, which happens too often in common practice in order to maximize learning. Uh, of course, if the patient is not responding on one of those branches, then we can quickly uh, get them back onto uh, another path because that's what we get by having everything prospectively tied together. The other important thing is if there are no good choices at all, then uh, the patient is referred to this very deep uh, sequence that I've previously referred to as precision ontology 3.0. So air traffic control to coordinate everything together with uh, two really important and novel innovations in equipoise situations to be able to randomize the choices with a Bayesian die so that the things that are more likely to work are going to get uh, more evidence on the one hand. And on the other hand, to be able to do deep science on that patient, but again, on the time frame that's likely to do some good for that patient. If we do all of these things, I think there's a very good chance that we can significantly improve the uh, survival of today's patients who would otherwise die, both because they're not getting 
the best care available. We're down, you know, in, in one of those other places in Europe, which is not at the level of Sweden. But also because we can rapidly raise the bar of the best care for everybody by learning to optimize the use of the drugs we already have. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's quite clear that uh, no one knows the optimal way to use melanoma drugs. If we could optimize that, we could raise these bars significantly. So that's what we're trying to do with the informatic systems that we have here. Not invent new drugs, per se, but to optimize the drugs that we already have. Okay, what are the roadblocks to doing this at a, at a systemic level? And uh, they're laid out here, and I think everyone, uh, everyone will know what these are. I mean, uh, you know, the widespread uh, reluctance of people to share data, uh, being able to access to the investigational drugs uh, that uh, one needs to be able to act on the recommendations of a tumor board often, um, getting access to various kinds of services, uh, and there's all kinds of molecular diagnostic services, which are not even widely known, much less how to get a hold of them. You know, different institutions have access to different services. That's what they use. Uh, for, for approved drugs, to be able to use them in off-label ways, there's reimbursement issues. And then there's regulatory policy, which makes it more difficult than it should be to be able to uh, test new, test existing drugs, as well as new drugs in experimental cocktails, where there are strong rational, uh, you know, rational hypotheses. Uh, that inform those kinds of experiments. So Cancer Commons is uh, trying to uh, lead an effort on the part of everyone uh, to step forward and help us solve these issues collectively because no organization can solve these alone. In terms of data sharing, uh, we are working with uh, a number of the national health services in Europe uh, on a, uh, to try to put together a uh, consortium that will pool this data with proper consents so that it can be used uh, in a molecular learning loop. And uh, the uh, three that we're talking to, the Netherlands, uh, the um, Belgium, and Scotland, uh, are you know, some of the smaller systems in Europe, but collectively 155,000 patients are something like three times as large as anything that we can do in the United States. Uh, uh, which are laid out here. So being able to get access to these patients properly consented uh, and the data in a pristine form that uh, is collected with NHS and then uh, work with uh, you know, pharma companies and testing companies to put in a molecular learning loop of the kind we've talked about in Europe is something that we're hoping can be jump-started and then extend to the U.S. So number one. Uh, Access to services. Uh, this is the same picture I used for Precision Oncology 3.0. And what I've done until I ran out of space was put down some of the many hundreds of companies that are relevant to each of the segments of this diagram. Everything from very well-known uh, places like Foundation Medicine uh, to ones that you may ne never have heard of, uh, such as Notable Labs which is uh, doing chemosensitivity testing in a novel way for leukemia patients. Uh, I live in Silicon Valley, and within you know, 25 miles of where I'm sitting, there are no doubt many hundreds, if not thousands, of companies that have interesting things that can be applied for, uh, to help uh, inform cancer decisions. And if you think about this uh, country as a whole, it's a very large number. There's a completely dysfunctional marketplace here. No one knows these companies even exist much less how to use them. So we want to make this uh, a rational marketplace with a directory where people, physicians, and scientists can very quickly find access to the tests that are relevant to them and basically do one-click ordering by background in e-commerce to be able to order those tests and then be able to get the data back into the system uh, so that, at least especially the outcomes data, so that it can benefit everyone and the community as a whole can learn. Uh, so uh, an example here of what we're trying to do with an industry alliance that we're in the process of putting together uh, to combine both the function of a marketplace and a data network is uh, we will refer patients to vetted services uh, that, and, and physicians that can help them, uh, especially to those who have agreed to make the data available in the commons back. Uh, and then uh, we will turn around to aggregate that data and make uh, the treatments and outcomes available to everybody, 
uh, who can use it for their own purposes, uh, whether it's uh, you know uh, validating a, uh, a biomarker or uh, figuring out how to treat the next patient or after a drug company repositioning the drugs. On the problem of how to get access uh, to drugs and uh, aligning incentives, at the moment there's a fight that goes on between you know, any patient who wants to get access to a particular drug or their physician and uh, the payer who uh, is often reluctant to approve a drug that hasn't been studied off-label. And uh, the uh, okay, so physician, patient, uh, payer. And I think there's a simple model that can be used. And I put this up as a straw man. I'm certainly open to other suggestions. But just as an example of what might be, might be done to align, get everyone aligned in the same direction. Uh, imagine a situation in which the physician applies for compassionate use on the basis of some compelling rationale that might come out of the information we're like capturing from a tumor board on another patient. Uh, the drug company, on the basis of that rationale, agrees to provide the, uh, the drug at no cost. And uh, frankly, uh, in most cases, the cost of the uh, powder is not going to be a major expense. It's the intellectual property that went into getting the uh, information that makes that powder a drug. The cost, that's where all the value is. So uh, it's not going to cost them much to put that up. Uh, the, uh, if the drug works, then the patient's insurer should pay for it. There's a contract that says the uh, care for that patient is covered. And if the drug works, the drug company should get reimbursed. So this is contingent reimbursement, uh, something in the practice that happens frequently in Europe, but doesn't happen uh, too frequently in the US. Uh, I think it should be more commonplace. And then, uh, you know, if the drug doesn't work, then, uh, you know, the patient uh, can be uh, uh, moved on to the next line of therapy. But, you know, little is lost. You know, the drug company might be out the cost of some pills, but we'll have saved years, uh, uh, you know, finding out in, you know, exhaustive laboratory experiments that seem to work that the thing doesn't work in patients. And in the end, you know, if it does work, they'll, they'll get a, a new indication. So this is something that I think aligns everyone's interests, the, that of the physician, the patient, researchers, pharma companies, uh, diagnostics companies, and so forth. Uh, finally, on regulatory reform, uh, I'd like to point out that uh, the, this amazing uh, breakthrough in AIDS uh, back in HIV drugs back around 1997 uh, which happened with the creation of the cocktail. Uh, what many of you might not know is what immediately preceded the, the year or two before the cocktail came was there was a change in licensing at the FDA, uh, but only for HIV AIDS drugs, uh, which said that these drugs could be approved not on the basis of the standard uh, safety and efficacy, but on the basis of safety and bioactivity. Uh, some of you may have seen the Dallas Buyers Club uh, movie in which uh, the patients you know, uh, were uh, lamenting that they didn't have access to uh, you know, uh, the drugs that were you know, uh, the early protease inhibitors, which were not very good drugs. So, but they did provide you know, a month or two of respite. And in the absence of anything else, the patients pleaded with the doctors and with the FDA that this is all we have. We've got to approve these things. And that led to uh, this one, you know, the only, I think HIV AIDS are the only drugs that it can be licensed on the basis of uh, safety and bioactivity, not snake oil. So once they were licensed, then the doctors had them in their toolkit and could begin experimenting with the cocktails. And I strongly believe that cancer drugs need to be uh, licensed in the same way so that they're available uh, to doctors who can combine drugs that might otherwise never pass never get uh, approved because they're not efficacious by themselves. But they may very well be just what's needed to make a cocktail work and, uh, and save lives. So uh, all of these things that uh, we talked about as roadblocks are something that no one organization can do. We have to come together. There's a lot of industry alliances, but none that I'm aware of that are addressing head on the problems that are needed in order to be able to solve those roadblocks and in general promote the widespread adoption of precision oncology while accelerating the acquisition of knowledge with everything we do, with every patient who's treated, continuous learning. Uh, I also frankly need to get uh, industry involved directly in what Cancer Commons is doing in order to be able to accomplish what we're trying to do. 
And so toward that end, uh, we've defined uh, a set of value propositions, and everything I've talked about is on the slide and has you know, uh, benefits to specific uh, communities. Uh, certainly the Cancer Commons Network and, and the uh, Cancer Maps are of interest to physicians and patients. Uh, and that's important because this will educate everyone about the value of precision oncology, which is something every company in this field needs because so many people are way under tested uh, for molecular uh, markers of various kinds that might be influential in, uh, in treatment. Uh, pharma companies will be very interested in streamlined trial enrollment and uh, making use of this uh, air traffic control as an alternative to traditional trials to be able to very rapidly uh, replicate uh, end of one successes and turn them into case series, which may be enough, by the way, to be able to uh, get reimbursement uh, because uh, a number of companies will, including Medicare, will reimburse on uh, published case series, which can be put together much quicker by being able to you know, have a registry that cuts across multiple sites to be able to get the patients that we need to replicate. Uh, the creation of a, diag of a diagnostics marketplace has to be of great interest, not just to physicians, but to the companies themselves that have these services so that people will be able to order them from uh, the very same uh, you know, knowledge uh, system, the uh, casebook that we talked about, that they're using to research cases. OK, what you need to do to see if this patient is like the patient here is to do this test. Here's where you can get this test from. And of course, getting uh, having a source of real-world outcomes and, uh, and uh, you know, cost data is very important uh, both to be able to figure out which treatments are cost-effective and uh, to be able to validate biomarkers. Uh, everybody needs that. And uh, the NHS initiative that I talked about is a near-term source. So in terms of uh, uh, people come and uh, become charter members of this industry alliance. Uh, these are the things that they'll get right away. They'll, they'll get the cancer maps, which uh, uh, will educate patients, uh, access to this data, and uh, the, the registry and the uh, beginnings of the knowledge base. So uh, with that, uh, I would like to uh, go through some takeaways and then open the floor to questions. So here's, here's what I uh, hope you'll take away from today. Uh, the first, that the lever that has the So I would like to um, give you some takeaways that hopefully will give you a different way of thinking, whether you're a doctor or a scientist or whether you're a computer scientist, for that matter. The first of which is just the importance, how important it is uh, to have information and informatics, uh, the role that it can play in uh, transforming human health. So that's not to say that we don't need new cancer drugs or uh, new, a deeper understanding of cancer or new uh, uh, biomarkers. All of those things are, of course, important. But we already have hundreds of drugs, you know, thousands of drugs that are routinely used for cancer overall, and uh, you know, thousands of uh, biomarker papers every year. And we need to find a way to be able to optimally use the ones that we already have. Because unless we can solve that problem, having the thousand and first cancer drug or bioinformatics uh, or biomarker is not going to make a profound difference. You know, one new drug is going to give uh, a patient, you know, one more line of therapy after they've exhausted the four or five that they already have. So unless we can solve the problem of optimizing overall drugs, uh, we're, and that's, this is an information problem. It's just a question of trying to figure out a way to capture the knowledge that's in the heads of many different people and bring it together so that we as a whole, as a, as a society, can learn how to optimize what we already have. So that's number one. Uh, number two is that, uh, and, and this is based on the, this assumption that no one today knows the optimal way to use any drug or even how to find out, and that's because of the limitations that we talked about, about clinical trials, that there are far more plausible regimens of drugs 
to be used. And I'm talking here about, you know, the half dozen or so drugs that one might use for their patient out of the thousand that might be totally available in what order, in what dosing, in when to start, when to stop, and so forth. No one knows how to do this within trials because there's far more hypotheses to test than there are patients. And inferring them from big data is like retrospectively looking back and sure you can infer how things have been used, but now how they should be used. That has to be done prospectively. Uh, absent definitive studies, we turn to our experts in order to be able to capture the knowledge that's in their heads. They've integrated everything uh, that is, is known uh, and are in a position to suggest the hypotheses. They may be right, they may not be right. That's why it's important to close the loop and validate. And they'll do this in, a, in an optimally efficient fashion. And that's where we're talking about an adaptive Bayesian process that can optimize treatment decisions for each and every patient based on all the patients that are, uh, have come before them. And the results of this patient immediately inform the uh, treatment of the patient who comes next. Uh, and given the wide variation in outcomes that we've seen uh, both in the US and across Europe, I think it's a very safe bet that we can, uh, if not you know, cure, uh, significantly extend the lives of many, many thousands of patients, a significant fraction of today's cancer patients, by optimizing the use of current drugs, uh, even without inventing new drugs. And of course, if new drugs get created, to the extent that we can rapidly integrate them into regimens so that they're used optimally, not as single agents, but in combination, uh, that's cool. And then the final one is uh, in order to be able to uh, do any of these things, we've got to get everyone to the table that needs to be at the table. And that basically includes all of you and all of your organizations. So I will end by uh, inviting you to please uh, join me in uh, uh, Cancer Commons in uh, moving this agenda forward. And uh, I'd love to hear from you. And also, if uh, you happen to know any, uh, any patient, someone in your family or uh, uh, someone acquaintance who can benefit from the kind of very deep precision ontology 3.0 that we're talking about here and has you know, an immediate need, uh, I would most welcome hearing from those patients because that's what we exist for. Thank you very much. Questions? Thank you, Dr. Tenenbaum, for that informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit the questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Dr. Tenenbaum, your first question is, much of your learning appears to be focused on molecular tumor boards. Can you explain why? Well, uh, you know, as Willie Sutton used to say, that's where the money is. Uh, here I'll say that's where the knowledge is. These, these are, uh, you know, often our best doctors at the most elite institutions working on the most challenging cases. And it's that knowledge which is locked up inside uh, their heads. And once they start talking about it and discussing it, it's a, it's a perfect opportunity to be able to um, elicit that knowledge in a way that's uh, you know, pretty easy to stick the probe in without imposing anything extra on their work. If we can learn from that and get that knowledge out to the world uh, and be able then to be able to uh, where most of the patients are seen, because the tumor boards don't see that many patients. They see a handful of patients. Uh, get it out to where, where the knowledge is and then be able to quickly close the loop and inform everyone, especially the, the places where the knowledge started, of whether this is a good idea or not a good idea. That's the way the system can learn and close the, the, the uh, knowledge terms many times a year as opposed to once every five or 10 years, as is the case in traditional research. I'm so sorry, we have run out of time for our question and answer session. Um, but any questions that were not answered during this presentation, Dr. Tenenbaum can answer those um, via email following the presentation. 
Now, before we go, Dr. Tannenbaum, do you have any final comments for our audience? What I said at the end of my talk, uh, I want. What I said at the end of my talk, I'd like to, you know, underscore, which is uh, first and foremost, if you know anyone who might be able to uh, use our help and uh, get connected to our experts, uh, you know, for their benefit and for the learning that everyone else might derive from it, please uh, have them get in touch with us or uh, visit the website. And if you would like more information about the industry alliance and what that might mean. Uh, to you as uh, an individual who has a vision of the future of precision ontology would like to drive it forward, or to your company uh, for that, uh, come uh, talk to me directly. Thank you. Thank you again to Dr. Marty Tenenbaum. I would also like to thank our sponsor, LabRoots, for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May 23rd, 2017. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you next time. Goodbye.